two transgenic approaches to uh, control aflatoxins in corn. That's uh, what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I'm going to see my collaborators, uh, Bert Bloom, Jeff Gary, and Ken and I were just uh, The last two at USCA ARS, as well as uh, Jesse James and Tuskegee. I'm going to talk about their roles here in a second. Uh, we all know pretty well the role of uh, the problems of aflatoxins, so I'll be brief, but Costs about $200 million of losses in corn annually, and almost a million all crops combined. Um, so this is a major economic problem, and uh, it causes, of course, uh, feed efficiency problems in, in animals, and cause mortality. But here I have a slide that shows the problem, problem so beautifully. And I wanted to show that slide particularly because um, there's been at least one published study and some non-published studies that show a fairly high correlation between the fungal biomass and the amount of uh, aflatoxins in the ear. And so, um, <coughs> talking about, I'm going to be emphasizing later. Well, here's, of course, we see uh, the black light, which uh, shows a compound that's related to aflatoxin, but it's really not very diagnostic. The uh, limits we all know pretty well for aflatoxins in the U.S. Uh, 20 parts per billion for for uh, human consumption and up to 300 for animals, uh, depending on what animals you're feeding. And over that, uh, can be fed without a special uh, permit from the FDA. And the problem with that is that we routinely see you know, 1,000 parts per billion from, from field samples that are that are, that are bad. So it can it can well easily overwhelm these these limits. So you can't. Um, you know, blend it out very easily, and even if there was something more than that, uh, I don't know what you'd want to do with it, because most of, most of it just needs to be uh, probably destroyed. Um, so the overview of my talk, I've already started with the economic impact of lab toxins as well as uh, feed efficiency problems, and with the strange disease, especially in Europe being so low, it, it makes it more difficult uh, to export products corn from the southern U.S. to, to Europe, which has just uh, ridiculously low levels. So, I have two approaches, transgenic approaches, based on two uh, antifungal transgenes of, of very different modes of action. And the goal in mind would be that be complementary and, and uh, give them a one-two punch. But the, I need to talk about a little bit about the background research that went into the first approach here. Uh, this research was done in Purdue, Charles Wolisch's lab, which uh, I've already mentioned a little bit already uh, by a student of uh, faculty. Basically, they found, as, as Dr. Shannon mentioned, that, that alpha amylase was very critical for the fungus to break down kernel starch and metabolize the glucose it produces in simple sugars into aflatoxins. So, um, uh, the glycolysis pathway is what feeds into uh, the secondary metabolite pathway for aflatoxins. So if we stop this pathway, uh, I can block aflatoxins. And they, they uh, developed a mutant of Flavus that uh, could not produce this amylase and it also was not able to produce the aflatoxin. So that really that study, along with some complementary studies, really how they've been towards the self amylase. <clears throat> Once they knew that, they began a screening project <clears throat> in which they took proteins from the seeds of 200 different species of plants and they tested them to see which one would inhibit this alpha amylase from aspergillus flavus. And they found one that was very effective from hyacinth bean. And in addition to Competitively inhibiting this, this enzyme and blocking it, they found that it had also a separate direct effect inhibiting growth of the fungus. Uh, binding hyphen tips, I believe, has a binding ability, collective binding ability. And here is just a list of different amyloids that tested sources. And of course, it inhibited uh, Aspergillus flavus, as well as a couple of other fungi. Um, but it didn't inhibit, of course, uh, it did not inhibit the maize. Uh, human or uh, basically hog uh, alpha amylases, so uh, digestion and, and breakdown of kernel structure by the, by the plant and also by the digestive uh, 
process of animals is not, not going to be inhibited by this. So the next step, of course, was to, to insert it into corn and produce it transgenic. Uh, they applied for funding, and they were never able to, to get funding to do this, and so it, it languished for a number of years until my collaborator, Bert Bloom, uh, brought it, helped me bring this to uh, Arkansas, and then we started uh, producing transgenics. Uh, this a few years ago with the uh, assistance of the Arkansas Corn Board. So, we put the alpha amylase but uh, under control of constitutive promoter so it would be expressed in all tissues. And um, that's important <coughs> for a couple of reasons because, um, first, we wanted the kernels, of course, but we also wanted the silks and the husks where uh, flavus initially infects because the pathology infection process, the spores typically land on the silks, burn down the silks to the kernels, and it's not until they reach the kernels and start colonies that they really produce aflatoxins. So if we can block it up front, and we maybe we can eliminate aflatoxin production. That's, that's the uh, hypothesis. So we wanted null tissues. And so uh, I, I also use the transformation services at Iowa State, Ken Wong, because they're great experts at this. Um, they did the hard part, which is the transformation. I did the easy part, which was the regeneration of plants, the seeds. And then went on to the analysis, which in development was, wasn't wasn't uh, quite as easy, but basically I uh, developed <coughs> several ways of anal analyzing these lines. I western blotting these lines to determine which lines have the greatest expression. Here we see um, the darker the band, the, le the greater the expression of the, of the uh, trans protein. And so I took lines that, that had the highest level of expression and I carried them forward, developed uh, homozygous inbreds and and also did um, some assays with corn leaf proteins from these lines. So support the germ, two germination assays. If you see my student uh, David Mites here, and this is what a, a flavus, a spore looks like after it's germinated. And we can measure this, the length of this spore, and when it's incubated with the corn leaf proteins and, and see how, what kind of intervention we're getting. And we found we had uh, lines with the transgene, <coughs> and compared the growth to lines that have lost the transgene through segregation, and we had reduced growth. And this is actually more significant than may be appear because when you extract the proteins and do this assay, there's actually about a six-fold dilution of the corn protein. So the fact that we can see something here it is, is impressive. And this phenomenon held up over, has held up over uh, subsequent generations uh, of testing both developing inlets. And so, this is not just a one-off thing. It seems to be whole. Uh, and this are just two experiments showing this. The means of two experiments showing that from another generation of this. So I'm just now getting to the point where I've, I'm able to produce enough seed in the greenhouse of an inbred line that produces this. And I've, I've monitored the, the expression of the trans protein in, in every individual to make sure that, that if there's any gene silencing in these lines, uh, that reduces the protein, we can eliminate those and, and uh, just carry forward to seed from individuals that, that have high expression. And so uh, I'm going to be doing field studies here this spring. I've already got an APHIS permit to do that here at Kimbler uh, Station in Arkansas. I'm also going to be working for my collaborators, USDA and ARS. They have a very uh, effective kernel assay. We send them some kernels from these lines so we can get both kernel assay data and whole plant assay data, which I'm, I'm hoping uh, all things will work out well in the field. In any case, I'm, I'm fairly confident we'll definitely get some kernel assay data. So that's where this initial project that I was funded by the corn board, parts of corn board, is at. And I'm carrying this forward at the same time. But with AMCO, I was able to expand into uh, another direction. Now, uh, that being expression of antimicrobial peptides in corn, which are also uh, uh, highly antifungal. I'm going to explain a lot more about them in a minute. But um, you see here, over time, um, hybrid corn lines have, have, uh, are having more transgenes than the uh, commercial lines are 
have stacked traits, and I think we're going to see a lot more of that where we have five or maybe ten value-added genes to these lines. And so I think you know, multiple genes, multiple approaches is a very reasonable thing to, to, to work on. So um, with that, I initiated this project to uh, use these antimicrobial peptides, which have a very different mode of action than in the first line, which will hopefully be complementary. I'm going to explain a little bit more about these, these antimicrobial peptides so I know why I chose them and, and, and what their benefit really uh, is. They've been studied for about 30 years and they're widely distributed in animals, higher animals, plants, and insects, higher organisms. They're an important part of the defense response, these, uh, these higher organisms. They're broadly antimicrobial often effective against a wide range of bacteria and fungi, very effective at low concentrations, and their, their chemical characteristics uh, ought to make them uh, bind well and interact well with microbial membranes, but not with uh, higher organisms like, like humans, so they're safe, they're harmless to plants and animals. Uh, we're the leading uh, researchers antimicrobial peptides, Dr. Jesse James, um, <coughs> has found that designing synthetic antimicrobial peptides based on the native ones, uh, by doing that, he can develop ones that are even more effective, effective at lower concentrations. And so uh, he developed one called D4E1, and in collaboration with uh, Jeff Carey and uh, Raja, USDA, ARS, and uh, New Orleans, he, um, <coughs> they found that this peptide was highly effective against a wide range of, of, of plant pathogens. And here you see, of course, most importantly, this Aspergillus flavus, uh, two separate strains of this, uh, being effective at, at uh, micromolar concentrations, 7 and 11, as well as a, a number of other path, pathogens, uh, cotton. It's based on the uh, Cecropin from the Cecropia moth. That's the, the native source, but it, it has a unique design. It's more resistant to the native than the native one, uh, Cecropin. It's evolutionary unique, so it's never been seen by, by any of these pathogens. And again, as, as I said, it's highly effective against a broad range of pathogens, but flavors specifically. They took that peptide, made a synthesized gene for it, and expressed it transgenically in cotton. And they found that both in cotyledons and in bowls, they had significantly uh, reduced amounts of, of fungal biomass as measured as, as they published here. And they also found that uh, after bulking up seed, cotton seed, that they were able to uh, show reduced amphotoxins in cotton seed. In addition to flavus and amphotoxins, they found that plants <coughs> also had significant resistance to Fusarium verticillioides and, and Verticillioidae, as well as a, another root pathogen, cotton. So uh, this is not the only study where antimicrobial peptides have, have been shown effective in transgenic approaches, but this is, this is really specific to aphotoxins and cotton. So the natural logical approach was to apply these in corn. And in doing so, uh, Dr. James developed a new generation of peptides that are even more effective than the old ones. And, what I'm working with is called AGM-182. It's effective at lower concentrations than the one in cotton, D4E1. Um, and in vitro assays, it's basically effective now at five micromolar concentrations. Um, it also killed spores of Fusarium versilioides and Fusarium aldaldehyde, very low concentration. So there could be um, additional benefit in giving other pathogens of corn and potentially other mycotoxigen uh, fungi in corn. This peptide, peptide is just a short protein, it's only 18 amino acids long, and given its small size, it should have a really small uh, metabolic cost to the plant. And of those 18 amino acids, five of them are lysine. So any expression in the, cur in the kernel may improve kernel nutrition because, you know, corn is low in lysine, so it may improve, it may improve feed efficiency. Uh, you know, I will uh, be 
you get. But, but uh, that's another side benefit. So broad spectrum resistance and possibly nutritional improvement. So I synthesized the gene uh, so I'd express it in corn. I did conan optimized for corn to get the maximum expression levels. Put it on the, the control of the equipment promoter, which expresses in all tissue, which I mentioned is important for a number of reasons. Um, primarily, that we want to express in the silks and the husks, where uh, flavors can either grow down the silks or through wounds in the husks, and then, and uh, thereby, if we can prevent it from reaching the kernels, uh, we should be able to prevent um, apoptosis accumulation, at least reduce the amount. <coughs> in addition, um, constituent expression allows ease of early stage testing in, in the first generation to see what kind of expression we're getting of this. Of this for this um, transpeptide. So we take the lines that have highest expression and have the best chance of really providing its resistance. This construct also included the barley alpha amylase signal, signal sequence, which what you need to know is that when this peptide is produced, it's exported out of the cell into the intercellular space between the cells. And that's important because here you see fungal cells, that's where the fungi actually grows. And we need to get this peptide, these antimicrobials, in location where the fungi grow at a concentration that's high enough to inhibit them. And I think uh, by targeting it, it increases the concentration of the peptide, uh, just total concentration, and also targets it to a, a um, appropriate location. So I put a lot of thought into designing this construct. Before I went through the lengthy uh, process of corn transformation, I wanted to make sure my construct actually did uh, what I to reduce. So I, I used transient tobacco uh, transformation, which takes about three to five days. I was able to extract proteins from tobaccoes after rejecting uh, agrobacterium construct in the leaves. And <coughs> I was able to do two things. One, validate that my construct worked. So here we see an ELISA assay where uh, proteins from tobacco uh, are with, inoculated with construct are showing uh, peptide at a <coughs> roughly about 0.15 micromolar. This is after, uh, again, about a six-fold evolution. But, uh, and here we see controls, the tobacco control and the buff control. So basically, we're getting expression in the plant, which I need to prove before I went through corn transformation. The second thing shows that we have, have a tool we need to monitor this in corn once we have corn transformers, which is the antibody. So I've got a whole body polyclonal antibody in this peptide, and it's working. And I've, all this is done before I went to transformation. So um, <clears throat> once I had this validation completed, I went and did, uh, gave the crown struct to Can Wong and in Iowa State. Uh, they produced transgenic callus. And I just got got that actually today. And I'm <coughs> plantlets and, and going to and I expect to have some transgenic seed uh, this summer, I guess. And so, and I'll be testing these uh, for expression levels in the spring. So here's, a, here's about where I'm at right now. So ongoing work with this project is uh, short-term, of course, regeneration of the, the T0 lines, analysis for peptide expression levels, uh, some, hopefully some uh, in vitro spore germination, germination assays with leaf protein extracts, and of course, uh, selection and, and inbreeding of lines for uh, new development. And long term, of course, we're going to build a field with this, um, and hopefully we'll be able to cross it with the first uh, objective, and so may potentially hit, hit the fungus with, with a two transgene and, and kind of shoot with both barrels and get better control. So, um, so far, this work is coming on well, um, and, and uh, that's where we're at. So I'd like to acknowledge the uh, people in my lab. Nathan Mines is the student who's worked in my lab for about four years. He's uh, absolutely phenomenal. He's done just about everything. Uh, Fred Rizzo, Errol uh did some work for me this summer, uh, another student. Uh, Jonathan Smith out of Berkeley's lab provided the flavor strain that I used in my bioassays. Ken Wong and Brandon Frame at, at uh, Iowa State. Transformation, of course, 
and uh, also very grateful to the Arkansas Corn Board for making um, development of this transgenic lines available as well as amicable for especially for the new uh, the new train new trench. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank you and answer any questions.